I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you, welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, I'm its chief cat herder, and I'm your host for this hour of conversation. We have a terrific guest and we have a vital, fascinating subject. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Late in 2022, the generative software program ChatGPT came out and ChatGPT lit the world on fire. It made many, many educators anxious, terrified, excited, confused. It gave us new ways of creating text with the help of software. There have been all kinds of debates, all kinds of issues so far. In fact, two of our forum's most popular sessions uh, occurred in December, where we took a deep dive into that. This week, I'd like to bring back a return guest, uh, a great, great hero of mine, Maria Anderson, to talk about it. Maria, if you don't know her, is a wonderful person. She's a futurist. She's a devoted math teacher. She's uh, an exceptional explorer of new technologies. She's the successful founder, co-founder of uh, the great software, Coursetune. And now she's here to talk with us about AI and curricula. How does ChatGPT, generative AI, how does that change what we teach as long as, as well as what we teach? So without any further ado, let me bring Maria up on stage. And greetings. Hi, Brian, good to see you. Good to see you. Maria, where are you today? I am in Salt Lake City, Utah, at my home. There's two Huskies next to me on the floor. Hopefully they'll stay quiet. <laughs> oh, good dogs, good dogs. And it's great to welcome you back. Um, you're always a delight to have on, on their program. You always ask great questions and you throw out great insights. Um, you know, I, I do want to ask you, I mean, you've just kind of closed a big chapter in, in your life with, with, you know, exiting course tune, which is such a, a huge, huge success. Um, I'm curious, looking ahead, what are you going to be working on for the next year or so? Um, that's a good question. Um, so when I left Course Tune, I wanted to kind of spend a year doing a Maria style sabbatical, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so my husband says that I'm like the most busy semi-retired person he knows. Um, so I decided that what I wanted to do was spend a year. I, I wanted to go back to teaching for a little while because teaching just like fills my soul and makes me feel like a whole person. And after so many years of... Mm -hmm. Uh, the corporate world and the last couple of years, I, I wasn't able to teach at all because I was so busy. Um, I just really needed to kind of fill that bank back up. Um, and I wanted to spend a year really thinking about all of the different technology arcs around us. Um, so I agreed to teach um, for a local STEM school that's a mile from my house. Wow. Uh, so I decided to take an adventure in K-12 and I'm teaching um a class that I call technology and society to the middle schoolers. Mm. And learn, the class is all about the human made world around them. So the first semester was all about infrastructure, uh, water, power, uh, transportation, agriculture. So kind of like the fragility and complexity of the world that keeps them alive. Right. And then the second semester, we're diving into all sorts of different um, technologies and, and how they have impacted society. So right now we're doing a unit on household appliances, and then we'll move on to medical technologies, communication technologies, computer technologies, and material science uh, technologies. And so it, it's kind of an interesting like way to just spend some time thinking about the long arc of all of these different technologies and, and what we did before and what we do now and what we take for granted. And to see it through the eyes of middle schoolers is really interesting because, uh, you know, they've, they've, the technological world around us is their natural world. They don't, they don't know anything else. Right. And, um, and so that's, that's an interesting perspective to see it from. And then I'm also teaching some business, like a business class. So I taught entrepreneurship last semester to the high schoolers and I taught teaching marketing and social media right now to the, to the high schoolers. And um, that's kind of an interesting pairing with looking at technology arcs and chat GPT. And uh, you know, we've been using chat GPT in classes. I'm here to tell you that all of my middle schoolers can use chat GPT like champs already. So that's the generation coming at you in a few years. Um, they, they are not slow to adopt. 
all my middle schoolers can use ChatGPT like champs. Just want to make sure you all hear that. Um, that's an incredible, incredible statement, uh, but not literally so. It's very credible, actually. Um, so, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, usually I begin by tormenting our poor guests with a question or two of my own. But then I get out of the way, uh, and the floor is all yours. So as Maria and I, but mostly Maria, talk for the next few minutes, please start thinking about the questions you'd like to raise about ChatGPT, about generative AI in general. And again, think on the bottom of the screen, that white strip, you know, press your raised hand button if you want to join us up on stage, or if you want to just ask a question by text, hit the quick Q&A box and offer your cue or your thought. Um, so I guess, Maria, that you mentioned the long arc of time. I'm wondering, what are some of the lessons that you learned in your reflections over the past year about how education absorbs and responds to technology that we can apply to ChatGPT? Is this like the rise of the calculator in the 1970s, for example, or film in the 1950s? I think it's probably akin to the rise of the calculator for mathematics, but you know, for every subject now. You know, I think in general, my I don't have a lot of trepidation about chat GPT like a lot of educators do, but that's because I've already been through this with math. Right. So math has had so many challenges uh, with technology. Math was the easiest thing to program. Math was the easiest thing to create tutors in. Math was the thing that we we had Wolfram Alpha. Like, what was that, like 15 mm -hmm. years ago? That mm -hmm. could just do everything in math. And we had to rethink things right now at a state level and in K-12, I'm still not thinking that re. I'm still not seeing that rethinking. I see a lot of universities who still have not rethought that curriculum. Um, but I do think this one's going to be really, really fast. And so unlike other changes that, you know, we kind of slowly start to think about about 10 years after industry, we're seeing uh -huh. the adoption on chat GPT uh, is faster than anything, any, any innovation we've ever had. Right. And um, if you look at like Roger's diffusion of innovation theory, there's like five things that affect how fast a technology gets adopted. And, and since I've been studying with my middle schoolers, uh, adoption of technology, especially household technologies, which is an interesting one, um, the, the five things that affect the speed of adoption and the, think about not just education, but this is the speed of adoption in all of the businesses and all of the organizations that the parents work in, the kids work will work in, right? You don't get to ignore how fast this is gonna happen. So one is, does the technology have a relative advantage over others? <laughs> yes, no question. If you don't th see that yet, you haven't actually been trying. Um, is it compatible with our belief system? And this is the one, the only one of the five that I think there's even a hiccup in. And that's because some people think like, ah, humans versus technology, we can't do this, right? Pandora's mm -hmm. box is open. Sorry, you can't put it back. Um, the next is um, how how easy is it to use? Is it very complex? And it's very easy to use. It is not at all complex. Uh, you can just have a conversation with it. You can tell it to do something over. You can tell it to add something in. It just does it. It remembers your private conversations unless you tell it to forget the private conversations or the, the prior conversations. And then the fourth is trialability. Like how easy is it to try? It's free and it works on your computer. Um, of course, there is a, a premium version coming out. They've announced today um, uh, for $20 a month, but they, it sounds like they'll keep the free version. And I'm super happy, actually, that they're going with a subscription model because the last thing we need is one more great technology that will be corrupted by people who pay to put your eyes on what they want you to see. Right. Uh, we have too many click-based, ad-based systems out there in the world right now, and they are creating bad experiences and bad information streams. And anyways, the fifth um, hurdle to adoption is, is it easy to observe others using it? So, you know, from what we've seen, it hits the nail on the head for at least four out of five of these. It's almost a textbook perfect release of a technology mm -hmm. in that they've made 100 million people use it in the first 64 days. It's Which incredible. Means, I think with uh, five days to a million and 64 days to 100 million, that means they, we should be at about a billion users in a, roughly 100 days. Mm. That's mm. an incredibly fast adoption. We haven't ever seen something be adopted that fast. 
Um, and uh, I think it's it's going to change things. And you know, I would like to just say that for the sake of this conversation, I don't want to get mired in. But what if students cheat? But what if students cheat? Uh -huh. Students have found ways to cheat with every single thing that has been invented. <coughs> we need to have better assessments in general. And guess what can help us write better assessments? Chat GPT. So like, yes. uh, if I wanna do more scenarios in my classes instead of multiple choice questions, um, I can ask Chat GPT to help me write business scenarios for my classes. Um, if I want um, to incorporate more uh, real world technologies that I know nothing about into my classes, I can use ChatGPT to learn about them very, very quickly, much more quickly than Google. Um, uh, is it 100% right? No, but usually its wrongness is so easy to spot that it's, it's not a problem. And our website's 100% right? right? Our website's 100% unbiased? Like, uh, I've been talking a lot about this boiled frog of Google, like, and I want you to pay attention to it. The next time you go to use Google, see how long it actually takes you to find the information you were looking for and how many websites you have to go to. Because I can get to the same point in ChatGPT, skipping all of the, like, go to this website, go to this website, go to this website, go to this website. I can just get a paragraph of response. And then if I'm not sure about a fact or I want to double check something, I can go look for that one thing. But I can get to a curriculum I can use in class so much faster using this. Uh, that it's it's really incredible. So I think the ability now suddenly for people to like leave the silo of what they teach and incorporate things from outside that silo has just gotten way, way easier. Way, way easier. Anyway. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a great answer. That's a terrific answer. Um, I was just going to put in a plug for um, a, a Chrome plugin that lets you uh, display chat GPT responses in parallel to your Google search, uh, which is a very, very useful exercise. Um, but before I can even ask you another question, Maria, um, get, questions have been flooding in all over the place. And so I want to give folks a, a, a chance to ask them. Uh, and here is one uh, from John at, uh, at Oregon. And John asks, is it more important to know what AI can do so we can use it and encourage its use or what it can't do? So we can create assignments that require individual thought, or maybe it's both. Well, I do think it's it's both, but I think that this is the biggest, I have been waiting for like 15 years for something new to happen in educational technology. And it just does like the last thing for me, well, from Alpha was like the last big new mm -hmm. thing that, ever ha that happened in, in yeah. educational technology. And everything else has been just tiny incremental movements, new companies doing the same things that old companies did, right? Mm -hmm. This is the first time in 15 years that I think we've really had technology that can push us forward. And um, I think we need to look at that, that first part of the question. Um, what can this do for us? You can use this technology to do a Q&A style training for students about a topic. Uh, Brian and I were talking about this a little earlier. Um, I can use this technology to, like if I wanna, this is especially great for differentiated instruction, which we talk about a lot in K-12, but not as much in college. Um, you know, you have students who naturally take to reading and students who don't naturally take to reading. I'm going to challenge you all to take a, a guess here at what the dyslexia rate in children is right now, uh, or what the estimated dyslexia rate, the rate of reading disabilities in, in U.S. children is right now. That's a good question. Uh, toss, your, uh, toss your thoughts in the chat. Without Googling it. Yeah, we're seeing 40% uh, Mathieu Plourd recommends 100%. Hello, Mathieu. 20%, uh, 75, 22, 50, 10, 15, 70. It is, it is about 20%. Human oh, beings yeah. were not built over tens of thousands of years to read text. In fact, the first dictionary, I have it up here somewhere. I think it was um 1828 was webster's first american dictionary 1828 so 200 years ago the first dictionary went into some homes the homes that could afford a dictionary right books trickled in after that encyclopedias if your family was wealthy enough to own them libraries 
but like our access to information and our ability to read is not some kind of inherent quality of human beings. It is on a spectrum, like everything else, right? And if 20% of our students can't actually read very well, we should probably do more to address those things, right? And we suddenly have technologies that can help a lot with this because, you know, where I was hesitant to use video maybe as a means of teaching something before because I had to watch the video, see what was in it, uh, you know, maybe create materials to go with it. I can actually use a chat GPT extension to grab the transcript from a YouTube video I can have it summarize that transcript from the YouTube video if I want a reading piece to accompany the video. I can have it pull vocabulary words out of it. I can go over the vocabulary words in class before we use the video. Like those are all things that would have taken me hours and hours to do before. And so I was just hesitant to do it, right? So in terms of like special education, um, we're asked to use graphic organizers for students who have difficulty reading to help them kind of summarize ideas and information which means you have to create the graphic organizers and fill them out. And, but like, I can actually have ChatGPT create a graphic organizer and fill it out. So then I just have to delete out the content and give it to the student for something. Um, I question sometimes why we teach like literature appreciation, but not presentation appreciation. <laughs> Perhaps it's because 75% of the population is afraid of public speaking. So imagine all of you who are afraid of public speaking, imagine being thrown into an educational system where the focus was on public speaking instead of reading and what that experience would feel like to you. But now if I want to like, uh, one of the things I decided to do today in class was um, to create little plays that we'll start class with. So we're learning about vacuum technologies in uh, technology and society. So we're gonna do a little play about a salesman coming to the door of a family in the 1920s and trying to sell them a vacuum cleaner, uh, which they've never seen before. And then in my marketing class, we're going to um, act out a focus group about uh, whether or not the school should adopt laptops instead of iPads. And both of those scripts that I'm gonna use with the students, I wrote in eight minutes using ChatGPT. So those are things I wouldn't have done in class before because I didn't have the time to do them before. So my challenge to you is start thinking about this as a push forward, a huge leap forward in like the amount of a diversity you can have in the activities in the classroom, because you can now, it's much, much easier. Oh, and one more thing I just have to mention for special ed. Please. To do things like rewrite, uh, you know, like if you have a text you're using with a class, but you have a student who reads three grade levels below the rest of the class, oh, that was oh. very difficult to accommodate before, but now I can oh. take body of that text, give it to chat GPT and ask it to rewrite it at a lower grade level. How good are the results? Very good. Game changer. And then of course it's text, so you can edit it as you like. Yeah. But the point is that I, I, I don't have to do that work of rewriting it now. Right. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, so many of us are functioning in schools with OER and no, no like yeah. support materials. Right. And so it's not like the textbook provides the text at six different grade levels for us, right? Well, so um, anyways, it's, I, I think it's a serious game changer. And um, if you're not really? seeing it that way, you need to go ex experiment a little bit more because this is really different, guys. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for that great question. Um, and uh, John and Maria, as always, thank you for that, for that splendid answer on uh, multiple registers. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, that was an example of the text question. Now let me bring up uh, a guest as uh, uh, a video question. Uh, let's bring up David Sprunger uh, from Whitman College. And let's see if we can get him here. Yes. Hello, David. Can you hear me okay? Very well. Yes. Excellent. Um, nice to Good see you all. Um, greetings from uh, pretty much sunny Walla Walla, Washington. Um, <clears throat> so um, I as I've been kind of digesting this and reading as much as I can read about this topic, um, I have been kind of, um, you know, you talk about the long arc of, of things and, you know, deep fake technology, um, Russian trolls that mess with elections. Um, do you watch uh, MSNBC or Fox? Um, 
do you turn in or use chat GPT generated material that you pass off as your own? Maybe not even as cheating, right? I, I read an article just recently about uh, real estate agents who are using it to generate their content faster, right? Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm really trying to synthesize and think about is, um, is trust, is, is the circle of trust that we, that in many ways is broken or reformed or lost or found or whatever. As we start down the road of, um, you know, OpenAI has ChatGPT um, backed by Microsoft. Google is right behind them. You can bet Apple is right behind them. It's, it's going to, this is going to be a, a flourishing bouquet of options, right? Um, which means that um, content that's generated and not just, as you know, not just content that's text driven, video, um, image, image content, um, it's going to be very, very, um, it's going to proliferate a lot. And, and the question will be with so much content generated that way, uh, what does that do to our circles of trust? What does trust mean now? And, and that's, a, that's a broader question than just um, AI. It's a, it's a question that affects, as I was listing, pretty much every sector of our lives. So that's something I'm thinking about a lot um, so, is, is that issue of trust. So let me, let me t address uh, two things. I'm gonna, I just want to write down um, the second one so I get to it, deep fakes and um, relationships. Okay, so first, I just want to address the deep fakes thing because I've gotten this question a lot from my students, actually. Like, if you can fake somebody saying anything from anywhere, then how do you know anything is true? Well, with every technology we build, we discover problems and we build another technology. So I suspect that within the next year, there will be an app that allows people at events to live stream their view of the event from the app and then puts together all of the different live views from people to verify that the speaker said what the speaker said at the place that they were at, right? Mm -hmm. So I suspect we will have, and we, we've seen some of this instant live streaming technology with some of the Black Lives Matter stuff, where people who were witnessing an event would open a specific app that would immediately start live streaming to a server so that if their phone was taken away, the, the video would survive, right? Um, and so I think this technology is just coming along, like journalism will have to come up with a way to verify that things have really actually happened and were said in the context of what they were said. Now that won't solve the, the potential of human bias to want to jump at the things that enrage us and make us angry and feed our worst fears, right? Um, one of the things we talked about in our, our marketing class just, just this last a couple of days ago was that um, when um, one of the Facebook scandals was actually, which we didn't hear a ton about in the United States, but it was in Europe, was a political party in Europe that accused Facebook of forcing them to take more extreme stances because the only way they could get enough views on their materials to become elected was to take more and more extreme positions because that's what drove the algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that some of these things come with uh, people becoming more educated about what is going on around them, which kind of brings me to my second issue, which I think that our curriculum is now seriously outdated. Our curriculum is seriously outdated. So uh, I went back and looked at what we've taught in the United States. In the 1800s, we taught primarily reading, writing, and arithmetic as a shortened school day because people had chores to do. In the 1900s, we added science, geography, and history to that. Um, and we had a huge, at that point, the 1900s, especially after World War II, we were building the man-made world, right? And so we had a big push around science. We taught all the science principles in school. We built all this technology that's around us in the, in the 60 years, 70 years after World War II, right? Um, and so today, what do we teach? We teach uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, science, history, government, and, and a plethora of other electives, which students may or may not get to. But we still have that core from the 1800s when information was super scarce, right? Super scarce. And that was how you accessed the information, was the ability to read and write. That is not how our students access information today. They watch videos. 
like my middle schoolers, they watch videos like champions. Um, and some of them, a very small percentage of them, the same you would expect in the general adult population love to read, but it's a, reading is a spectrum, right? And so I think um, when, you, when you look at like the world we live in today, if you were to start over, I actually think one of the most important things is understanding the world around us because it's so complicated. And another one of the, the, the um, to kind of bring it back to the first part of your question, I think there should be classes in relationships, alliances, negotiation, mediation, compromise, strategy. How do you get a group of people to come together and do something together? How does that happen? If we're gonna focus on history, maybe we should focus on all the moments in history where humans learned how to do something together. Because those are the things that are gonna save our society, right? I think um, pattern finding is still important, making connections between things. Um, no, but understanding the fragility and complexity of the world around us. Every time I hear, sorry if any of you on here are libertarian, but every time I hear a libertarian talk about, we don't need any government, we don't need any government, I think, do you have any idea how the clean water gets to your house? how the electricity gets to your house, how the logistics of the transportation systems work. These all have a very large government hand, whether it's your local government, your state government, or the federal government. That's like Maslow's basic needs. And I think that most humans in the United States have lost the understanding of what goes into that. Well, that should be an important aspect of the schools. Plus it might teach so our kids some survival skills because they may need that in the future that we are giving them. I think so. Um, Maria, thank you for the answer. David, what a great question. Um, and please say hi to our friends in Walla Walla and uh, enjoy the sunlight as you can. Will do, thank you. We have a, a, a ton of questions, friends. And again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. In fact, we have more video questions coming up. So let me bring up uh, the very fine Maha Bali coming to us from American University in Cairo, Egypt. So let's see how our connection is. And hello, Maha. Hi, Brian. Hi, Maria. Thank you so Good much for doing you. this. And thanks for having me. So I can see people are curious in the chat. So I'll, I'll share some context. I'm at the American University in Cairo here in Egypt. And there are three things I want to tell you guys about what it's like here in Egypt. And then I have a couple of questions for you, Maria. So the first one is ChatGPT is blocked in Egypt. So if you try to use it, it tells you it's not available in your country. The only way to go around it is get VPN, get someone's phone number from a country that has ChatGPT in it to be able to verify your number so you can't use an Egyptian number, and then use incognito window. Mm -hmm. So I had to do all that yeah. until I could figure out how to use it. But there are other text, tool, you know, text generation tools that are available. But a lot of students can do all this stuff that I just did. So it works, but it's just not meant to work here. So a lot of people say, oh, it's free to everyone with an internet connection. There's a lot of countries other than Egypt also that don't have it. And we're not really sure why, because it looks like OpenAI is blocking it in Egypt, not Egypt is blocking it. So there's that. The second thing is I've tried it in Arabic. <laughs> you know how beautiful ChatGPT is? Like it's very, like you get infatuated with it at the beginning of the kinds of things it will do for you. It's Arabic is like a six-year-old writing Arabic. And I don't know if it's learning. So clearly it wasn't trained very well in Arabic. I think it translates and then it auto-translates back. So it doesn't do a very good job in that. And then the other thing we know is that it's trained not to be rude, right? But people are starting to talk about, is that a restriction on freedom of speech and who gets to decide? So I want to share with you an example of something that is really controversial, controversial and why it refused to tell me. So I was asking it to make feminist interpretations of Quran verses. Now, Quran is the yeah. most holy book, right? And you know what it said? It said, the Quran is the holy text or the sacred text of Muslims, and I'm not allowed to, or I'm not going to get into this because I don't want to offend anyone. Like Feminist interpretations of Quran, a little bit controversial, but not in themselves like an offensive thing. So, it, I mean, I respect it that they didn't want to go there, that they didn't want to show bias in some way or whatever. But I also thought, why, why don't you want to talk about this at all? 
like not even at all. So that was an interesting thing. And so I have a couple questions about this in terms of just uh, social justice. So, I mean, I, in, in my institution, we're just trying to encourage people to, to learn how to bring this into classes. And I posted in the chat about critical incorporation of AI, recognizing its shortcomings, the ways it can be problematic and all that, which I think you've talked about, but also all technology is, right? No technology is new at all. But then this epistemic injustice element of, we, we know it's been trained on diverse data, but where's it going with all of that? What, what, amounts of knowledge does it have no idea of? And if we keep using it, how is that going to potentially limit how we think? I've used it to brainstorm. It's been great. Uh -huh. um, if I get used to using it to brainstorm, will I start to lose uh, my voice, my way of thinking? Uh -huh. Or uh -huh. Usually I use it when I have a brain block, right? But um, my boss and I, the other day, we asked it to write something in the voice of a non-native speaker. <laughs> and so that was very interesting because it could do that too. Uh, because suddenly, if all our students sounded like ChatGPT, would be able to just <laughs> tell something's wrong over here because they're not supposed to sound like native speakers, you know? Yeah. Okay, Maria, epistemic so, injustice, I think, is the some one. Some really great perspectives. Thanks for sharing that. I think like any new technology, you can't build for the entire world and also every ability at the same time, right? You have to start somewhere and you have to release it fast enough that you can afford to keep doing the rest, right? So I, I would say that my guess is other languages, things like that, they're just gonna lag behind a little bit, the the, the native technology. But I do know uh, one of the things that I've noticed also uh, looking from a feminist perspective is that I don't think that ChatGPT, I think that it has a very male centric perspective um, and I'm saying this because I've asked it about like when I was developing my syllabus for my class, I was asking it about, you know, like, what do you think are the top 25 medical technologies in the last two centuries? And um, it listed, you know, because I was just looking for particular ones I would pull out. Right. Which is so great at generating lists. It didn't list the birth control pill, uh, but it listed penicillin. Right. It didn't list IVF for example, but it listed heart transplants, right? Oh. And and so I think it uh, it does have a little bit of a male perspective and probably other lack of diversity perspectives, probably a white male perspective, right? And, you know, it ingested all of Reddit, I believe. So, you know, the primary population of Reddit is probably not diverse females. And, and so I think what they're going to have to do to balance it is have it digest some forums and and areas that do provide it with more of that perspective. I mean, in the meantime, we're educators, we can make sure that students get these other perspectives and even that as they're working side by side with the AI tools, that they actually add in those perspectives as part of the assignment, right? Um, so I don't think that's a bad thing. I do just have to recognize that these are the problems and then, you know, but yeah, textbooks have had a, uh, those perspectives, newspapers have had those perspectives, magazines have had those perspectives, right? This is not new to us that the media, prevailing media would not have a female perspective, right? Um, but what is interesting is to think that you could potentially add those perspectives in by just finding the right materials to digest, right? Uh, and so that these are curable things in the technology um, and that 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 might actually introduce some of those topics more into the mainstream by surfacing them. When we send people out to websites to get their information, I, as a technology platform, cannot alter the websites, right? But as the technology platform for ChatGPT, I could make it my mission to make sure that our platform is more, um, has a more feminist perspective and go about doing that, right? Whereas Google's not likely to be able to influence millions of websites to change overnight, right? So mm -hmm. I think there's more potential here for fixing some of these things. Yeah. In, in the same way that Wikipedia do feminist hackathons, for example, yes. and they made the interface yeah, exactly. easier. And yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just if they block it in Arab and Muslim countries, where are they going to get the data to improve it in that sense? So yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Maria. Yeah. Thank you for your perspectives. Thank you, Baha. And have a good night. Good to see you. Uh, and that's another example of video question. And I was about to say to encourage you all to ask questions, but we already have an enormous stack. Uh, so just looking ahead a little bit, since we have 19 minutes left, 
Uh, I would like, unless anyone objects, uh, folks in the chat, I would like to uh, copy the chat, anonymize it, and publish it to the web afterwards because you have a lot of great conversation. And everyone who has questions, uh, if we don't get to them, I would like to also put them uh, online as well so that we can not lose sight of them. Um, so if you have any issues with that, please let me know in the chat. I'll just add here that if, if, if any of your schools would like to have a longer conversation, if you want to have a conversation with faculty or something like that, you could always invite me to come talk. Um, I have to somehow supplement my income in the summer because as a K-12 teacher, I don't get income in the summer. So uh -huh, uh -huh. just throw that up there. Always happy to see you there. Um, <laughs> we have a, a, another, uh, another uh, video question. This comes from Gail Ryder. And let me see if we can bring Gail up on stage. Gail, it looks like your camera is off, and I think your mic is off. It must um, be behind a VPN or um, a firewall. What's happening? Or just, to or, or just need to reload the page, uh, Gail. So if you just reload the page and uh, make sure that you turn on your mic or give uh, Shindig the ability to use uh, your mic and your camera, uh, that would be good. Because I don't want to lose your question, Professor Ryder. Uh, we also have a question from Doug Holden. Uh, whose name I always managed to uh, struggle with, but I hope it didn't get too badly this time. Hello, yeah. Doug. Yeah, the uh, Hohulan rhymes with no foolin. Yeah. Hohulan, that's right, that's right. Yeah, like, no like, problem. Like, yeah, like, a great, uh, great uh, um, discussion. Um, you know, I'm uh, actually speaking on education and healthcare and chat GPT, um, though it's generative AI in general. Um, so a couple comments is, um, I have this blog going, uh, when will we have a billion of something? And so I worked at I worked with Motorola and Nokia and worked in the cell phone business. You know, we had a billion uh, cell phone users in 2002, a billion smartphone users in 2011. And, uh, you know, and right now we have a five billion smartphone users. So there's one point, I think, three billion um, students on this planet. And uh, the question is, how many of them will want to be using generative AI? Um, actually, while we talk about chat GPT, there's actually there's a site and I put it into the chat of, of over 600 different generative AI, um, you know, um, location, uh, you know, uh, pro, um, companies out there uh, doing things um, when there was a talk on what is uh yeah, you know, why, you know, like an Arabic or whatever, um, there's a site, um, uh, one of the best um, sites I would recommend is Life Architect, um, which uh, goes through all kinds of uh, information and uh, talks about what's in the, uh, you know, what do they use to, to do the pre-training? Um, so, you know, it, it will be interesting to see how this technology is used. Is it going to be for education? It will be used like a, um, a, a calculator, um, will it be used for something much more than that. I'm a big believer in collaboration. I trust ChatGPT like I trust a very smart teenager who thinks they know it all. And you obviously need to vet the information. So, and even an expert who thinks they know it all, you know, find three experts and find an expert who disagrees with the other experts um, to come to the right conclusion. And then finally, I would just end in, there's a book um, called The Half-Life of Facts. And uh, I, I believe the average fact has about a 10 year half life, um, you know, because information constantly is changing and being updated. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the author of that book um, here is in Kansas City, where I live. And uh, I, I plan to reach out to him. And what is the meat? You know, you do pre-training, but if you do pre-training on wrong information, you're, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And uh, so what does that mean as well? So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited for this technology that it could be a, a useful as long as the human's in charge, right? The human in the loop, you know, and uh, how do you keep the human in the loop? Uh, for, <coughs> I would say use the technology, but then I just like you have to defend a thesis paper. You know, if you're a Ph.D., sure. I would say whatever document, you know, a student turns in, they have to defend what everything is in that document. And so when they're using uh, any tool, you know, can they defend this and say, okay, this is what the tool gave me, but can I defend that that information is valid, is accurate, you know? And so it, it translates from being a tool to is my, part of my creativity. So garbage in, garbage out, but creativity in, creativity out, and always vet the information. So those are some of my thoughts. Well, thanks, Doug. So I just, wanted, I just wanted to add a couple of thoughts after that. Um, I've, uh, I keep coming back to this example. I don't, it's like stuck in my head, but, mm. um, yes, we can have misinformation in a tool like this, right? 
I've worked in curriculum for a very long time. We have states that publish textbooks that leave out important historical details mm -hmm. of our country because they simply do not want their citizens to know those details, right? Mm -hmm. Some human has made that decision to completely bias the education of all of their children, right? So yes, a human needs to be involved, but we also need to think about the kinds of humans we, and, and I don't know, maybe, Maybe, maybe ingesting all of the information is not so bad because at least all of the information is there, uh, not just the portion of it that one particular body wants the rest of the world to have. I think some of our, our, our uh, discourse in the United States right now is because there's suddenly more information than there has been in the last you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Right now, if you if you question what you're hearing, you can go find other sources of information, which was not the case when you had an encyclopedia and a library and your teacher, right? Uh, and so I think a lot of our, our our mayhem is happening over the ability to access information. So maybe having systems that can actually pull the information fast from lots of different places is, is maybe not the worst thing that's going to happen to us um, because maybe we'll see a more balanced perspective. But I also just want to challenge uh, something about research and, and you know, making sure that you, you do your research. We've now seen so many cases where the research studies and peer-reviewed articles, peer-reviewed journals, they're not replicable, as it turns out, right? And so without replication, we don't necessarily, we can't actually, even though you did everything you were supposed to in writing that dissertation or that thesis, you went to all of the the peer-reviewed journals, you pulled out the articles that supported or disputed what you wanted to say, uh, you know, that even your, 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 your half-life of facts, right? The facts in some of these journals aren't actually facts either, right? And, and one of the things that really struck me when I was writing my dissertation was when you get to chapter two and you're, you're like researching all previous history in this topic, but you have to paraphrase it all. You can't like use the author's words. You have to do it in your own words, right? But at some point when a thousand people have all paraphrased the words of the original authors in the same body of information and with 8 billion people on the planet, that's for sure happening, right? At what point are we allowed to just say like, there's this cited body of information here from 1800 to 1900 and I'm just going to cite that and go from there, right? Like, I mean, at what point is this just kind of a ridiculous exercise that stops somebody, like if you read the body of information and then pulled out a couple things, but then cited it, right? Couldn't you move forward faster? I mean, and isn't that what ChatGPT is essentially doing? Is it's just moving us forward a little faster? Like, yeah, you got to vet things. You got to put it through your own filters. You got to add perspectives that might not be there. But I mean, at what point are we going to stop forcing everybody to do some of these things because you did it, right? Like, I don't know, just some thoughts. Yeah, no, fantastic. One of the comments was about uh, the, the tool where you can say, um, you know, write this in the, the second grade level and so forth. Um, the NIH says that the average, uh, you should communicate healthcare at a sixth to seventh grade level. And the, you know, like WebMD is at a seventh grade level, you know, and, you know, so I was playing around saying, okay, do die, take WebMD and make it at a second grade level. Um, yeah. So, so that's a really, you know, say, or a fourth grade level. Yeah, there. no, I, I've had a lot of fun teaching. Um, I've been teaching Rogers uh, Diffusion of Innovation to my students and, you know, having it just take all of his language down to a sixth grade yeah. level. It's been super yeah. fun to see. You know, so that's going to be extremely yeah. valuable as well. Yeah. Um, no, I teach uh, Rogers to my grad students and, and it's not easy for them. So uh, maybe I should try a bit of this as well. Uh, Doug. Good question. And uh, is your is your colleague uh, Sam uh, Arbersman? Yeah, right. Yeah, the, someone that lives in Kansas City. He's not my colleague, but I know him. I've met with him before. I'm going to reach out to him and see what his thoughts are with this. Because I put in, um, you know, what's in my um, AI today? You know, what do you get pre-trained? And, you know, some of the uh, other tools coming out, generative AI tools, are looking at different ways of training, right? So, um, you know, in fact, there was an article about the Chinese are trying to have a 
um, equivalent, you know, so they have the change, you know, what corpus of body do you have training on? And I guess going back to your comments about, you know, you know, it's, what information do you present to the student? What do you not do? You know, it's always like, how do you filter that? And then finally, there, you know, you have this engine on top of chat GPT to say, this is my ethical engine. So I don't want you to say it, talk about X, right? And when in doubt, you know, don't set, talk about this because, you know, you're going to, you know, fools rush in where angels fear to tread, right? So, okay, I'm not going to talk about X because it, it's it's controversial. Um, though at the same time, you know, you're not going to learn if you don't jump into some of these topics. Is how do you respectfully as well? So these are uh, challenges of the human uh, nature, um, but it's a, it's going to be a great journey. And I think this just amplifies human creativity, um, both at the uh, you know at school level and then at, at the professional level. So I'm I'm hoping we you know this this is an AI tool that will just amplify the human yeah. ability. Maybe just one more thought about this. Uh, I've I've been saying for at least a decade, maybe two that um, one of the best ways we can teach, especially some of the more technical subjects like math, is to personalize the content to some of the interests of the students, right? Mm -hmm. To have word problems that are in the field that they're interested in in college. But certainly in K-12, we can do it as well. Like if you have a bunch of students who are interested in Minecraft or Legos, you can uh -huh. have ChatGPT write word problems about Minecraft and Legos, right? Like write me linear modeling problems about Legos, write me linear modeling problems with about these topics, right? Like it's so fast and you can, you can target the interests of the students you have. And that was not easy before, right? right? Like, so again, if you're not, if you're not looking at this as a way to really start connecting in a deeper way with your students and to really start to meet them where their needs are and to help them, to like hone their own skills. Like so many of our students, they, they don't have a lot of creativity, right? For whatever reason, we maybe have driven that out of them. Uh, oh. But ChatGPT is actually really creative. Like for my entrepreneurship students, they used it to generate po potential names for businesses. So I had a student who was, um, we, we had talked about, we were talking about climate change and how it might change the mountains here in Salt Lake. So what if there's no more ski resorts? How could we use the mountains in a different way? And one of the oh. ideas was to um, build hiking trails in the mountains that follow uh, the plots of books. So as you're walking, you can do the the walk to Mordor on a trail, right? And so one of my students, you know, had chat GPT generate names of businesses that were in the Wasatch Mountains that at least land to build trails that followed the, the plots of novels. And then, you know, a second it had 20 names that were better than any we could come up with that incorporated plays on words about reading and novels and, you know, uh, use the mountain setting and Utah and like, you know, some of these things are just going to be great for, for people who just don't have a particular skill, right? right. Uh, move them forward yeah. and get them to the next thing the, the, to actually plot the business they're going to make instead of getting stuck on it, what are they going to name it, right? Yeah. Yeah, we build on the um, shoulders of giants. In fact, what I would encourage, and this is what I do when I use ChatGPT, is I say, okay, this is the prompt I use, this is the output I got, and then this is what I did to enhance the output, right? Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, and I, if, for students, it's like, okay, just don't regurgitate whatever ChatGPT yeah. gave you. This is what your 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 the prompt engineering. This is what was created, and then you have to go on top of that creativity, right? Yeah. And why did you do? So, you know, ha you have to think about what are you doing above Chat GPT. You're you're a, a human. You have, should have more intelligence than the AI, uh, especially around creativity. So, you know, if a job is very dangerous, difficult, or dull, give it to the AI. But for jobs that are creativity, uh, compassion, well, kindness, those are where you know human spirit shines. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, that, that's my, uh, you know, would be my encouragement to all the, the educators out there. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, thank you. And thank you for uh, joining us on this journey. It's always good to hear from you. Uh, friends, we're, we're running out of time, and I, I want to make sure that we get some of these questions in. And here's one that came up about three or four times. Uh, Ed Finn asked it, and uh, one other person asked it, and we've touched on it briefly. Maha Bali raised it as well, but let me just... Uh, share this. Do you think that tools like ChatGPT will further accelerate a learning divide for those who do not have access, a new, steeper digital divide? That's John Opper. Thank you, John. I think that's a great question. Um, I think it depends on the model they use for monetization of these tools, right? And thankfully, there are a lot of tools coming out, it looks like. And a lot of tools means competition, and competition usually drives down uh, the cost for the consumer. 
Um, I am really hopeful that we will end up with one of two models or maybe both models. One model would be just subscribe the subscription. Schools could pay for the subscription. People could pay for the subscription. If it, if it ends up being around the cost of a streaming service, then you're like, we could probably, most people can probably uh, afford it if they need to. Um, that doesn't uh, deal with the bigger issue of do you even have internet, which is still a problem, uh -huh. is, right? Uh -huh. um, and so if you still don't have internet, yes, the divide's worse, right? Um, but the other model I think that I, I hope would be the possible model is, you know, like do a search, see an ad, look like at the TikTok model. Here's your six uh -huh. second ad, do a search, uh -huh. see an ad. That would be better than what we have with, uh, with the boiled frog Google phenomenon, which is that you will see the things that marketers want you to see in the searches. That is what you now get in Google, right? Um, because that is what they have optimized for. And uh, I, I think it's actually quite bad and biased, the search results now. Um, what about uh, learning how to use ChatGPT and similar tools effectively, the whole skill, call it uh, prompt generation. Is that also one that might be shaped by a divide? Well, um, I think I think it's it's maybe too early to say, but we already don't do a very good job in, in K twelve of adapting or higher ed. Higher ed is just as guilty adapting to new things. Um, I don't, I still don't think we've adapted to fully to the information rich world in higher ed. We still teach oh, right. subjects exactly the way we taught them in the nineteen hundreds. Uh, and that should have changed by now. I actually am really hopeful that ChatGPT will actually force this to change, that we will actually be forced to come up with better curriculum, better ways of teaching things, that, to humanize some of our curriculum in ways we don't, we, we have factized curriculum still in so many places, but maybe we need to have more humanized curriculum. Um, it's it's hard to teach about some of these things. It's hard to incorporate brand new events in the world into your curriculum as mm -hmm. ChatGPT adapts. And um, like right now, the information is two years old. So you actually, one great way to uh, to change an assignment right now, for those of you looking, is just to make sure you incorporate some very current event into it. <laughs> because ChatGPT doesn't have that information yet, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think we can use it to to create a, a better curriculum in general. And I, I, uh, I'm hopeful this will force the issue on us. Um, well, the, let me ask one question. This is a, a synthetic question drawn from some of the questions in some of the chat. And I, I think this might be a good way to, to, to wrap things up. Um, we're looking at ChatGPT3 as a singular item because it is singular. Four. Really really four. Is four out now or not, not out? Yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We're, we're using three. Um, but we should expect to see a, a proliferation of similar tools. Um, and I, I'm curious what you anticipate. I mean, for example, um, should we expect to see similar generative text tools driven by individual corporate needs? So Google eventually releases their own, Apple releases their own, perhaps tuned more towards media, uh, perhaps nations release their own. So China publishes one that is bias towards Xi Jinping thought. Um, you know, India releases one that might be more in tune with Hindutva. Uh, maybe we, we see a Catholic uh, chat GPT appear. Maybe we see one that comes out of the library world, one that comes out of the academic world. I, I'm just curious, looking ahead, that kind of proliferation, do you see that as well? Or, and uh, How should education start thinking about that? I do think we'll see all of that. I think if you, if it exists in the dating world, it'll probably exist in the AI world, right? So if there's a dating app for that particular population, probably there'll be an AI for that particular population, right? Um, and uh, and certainly for different disciplines having different needs. You know, you know, I'm already kind of imagining how um, how we're gonna see this quickly built into all sorts of different uh, software that we use, right? I mean, Microsoft says it's incorporating ChatGPT into Word, mm -hmm. PowerPoint, um, mm -hmm. uh, all of its products as fast as it can do it, right? Um, Google, I think rightfully so, is very worried about what's going to happen to Google. I think they should be. My students are like, as soon as it's there in Bing, I guess we're all moving to Bing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think... 
I think there will be a proliferation first and then probably some consolidation of those engines, right? I mean, we've seen that we seem to be have no problem letting monopolies form in the United States. Uh, so uh, it's probably good that uh, OpenAI is a somewhat somewhat independent entity right now. They can probably gobble up some competitors as fast as they grow, become a new, a new uh, power in the world in a way that I don't think Google would be allowed to gobble up anybody at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Finally, mm -hmm. starting to put the brakes on some of this um, anti-competitive behavior. Um, so I don't know how good of an answer that is, but I do think you're going to see a, a, a wide variety of stuff at first. In the same way, we've seen a wide variety of social social media companies and a wide variety of dating apps and anything else that involves human beings. So dating apps, and uh, we should anticipate uh, AI antitrust coming up. Probably. Um, Maria, we are sadly out of time. Uh, and as always with you, our time passes swiftly and well. Thank you so much for being a terrific interlocutor uh, and just a, a wonderful fountain of ideas. Um, what's what's the best way to keep up with you in, in your in your manic world of thinking and teaching and futuring? Um, these days, I tend to just post quick quick things on LinkedIn. I'm pretty busy with uh, teaching and um, okay. trying to get my K-12 teaching license is really something else. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, and then Busyness Girl is, is, you know, where I've posted things in the past. And if I, I'm thinking about moving over to a new site. So I guess if I, the RSS will go to the new site. So if you subscribe at Busyness Girl, it'll eventually subscribe to the new site too. So. Very good. Well, we'll follow you. And uh, once again, thank you so much. Um, looking forward to having you back for a follow-up. Yep. Take care. And friends, don't go away. Uh, let me just point out, uh, let me wrap things up with a few notes and thank you all for the terrific questions and comments. Again, we're gonna put these up on the blog just because this is such a rich discussion. If you wanna keep talking about this, uh, I've already been tweeting this at Twitter, so you can use the hashtag FTTE. You can tweet at me, at Brian Alexander, at Shindig Events, or if you're on Mastodon, there's my Mastodon handle. And of course, on my blog, uh, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to dive into our previous sessions on ChatGPT, as well as related topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And looking ahead, we have a whole series of sessions, including another one in March on uh, AI and academia. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. If you're doing your own work on uh, AI, please shoot me a note. I would love to be able to share that with everybody else. Just email me right there. And again, thank you all for a great conversation, international, intercontinental conversation. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, I hope this has been useful for you. Good luck. I keep exploring all this, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>